is Zora Mulligan. I'm the Commissioner of Higher Education. I wanted to welcome you back to the Talent for Tomorrow podcast. We're calling today's episode Rethinking Conventional Wisdom, and we're going to take a look at three different areas that people often have misperceptions about and try to ask if those misperceptions really do align with the truth. One of the areas we'll be looking at is liberal arts degrees. There's a pretty widely held belief that liberal arts degrees don't lead to jobs but do lead to debt. We're also going to be looking at apprenticeships and the role of the trades and apprenticeships in workforce development. And then finally, we're going to talk with some students and faculty who participated in career and technical education programs and really are living proof that when you go through those programs, they often open the doors to lots and lots of opportunities, good wages, uh, and good jobs. So here with me today are Rob Dixon, the Director of Economic Development, and State Representative Travis Fitzwater from District 49. The first person we're going to talk to this morning is Truman State University, Dr. Sue Thomas. Okay, good morning, President Thomas. Uh, First off, you know, we talk a lot about liberal arts, but tell me a little bit about what that exactly means. Well, you know, it's interesting. I think... um, in these days, people somehow think that the liberal and liberal arts is connected to political affiliations or perspectives. You know, for example, to the opposite conservative. But it actually has nothing to do with politics at all. You know, if, to get a little bit intellectual on it, it traces back to the Latin word meaning free or unrestricted. And we really see liberal arts that permits the liberation of the mind. And I think lots of people think about the liberal arts in terms of areas of courses. You know, it goes back long ago in medieval European universities, or currently people think about the liberal arts as the humanities, social sciences, natural sciences, and formal sciences. And so as you can see that while most people may think of the liberal arts as humanities, it encompasses much more than the humanities and includes many of the sciences. And I think for us, in current thinking, liberal arts education also embraces the idea of a liberal education. And the American Association of Colleges and Universities, if I may quote them, I think gave a really good definition of what a liberal education is. And they say it's an approach to learning that empowers individuals and prepares them to deal with complexity, diversity, and change. It provides students with broad knowledge of the wider world as well as in-depth study in a specific area of interest. A liberal education helps students develop a sense of social responsibility, as well as strong and transferable intellectual and practical skills, such as communication, analytical and problem-solving skills, and a demonstrated ability to apply knowledge and skills in real-world settings. And so I think, as you can see, what people generally thought about the liberal arts and liberal education and what it actually is can be quite different. I thought that observation was really interesting, and that definition helped the conversation quite a bit. Um, my colleague Travis Fitzwater followed up with another question. Yeah, President Thomas, thanks for being with us again. This is exciting to have a liberal arts president on the on the podcast. I had a question about perception of liberal arts grads. I think there's this this idea that you know maybe they're not getting the the focused education you may get at a at a big box school. How do, you, how do you really refute that, that image as you're leading a really, really great institution here in the state of Missouri? Uh, well, first, thanks for recognizing um, Truman's impact. I really appreciate that. You know, we are very proud of what our faculty and staff and students do, and our graduates go off and do amazing things. And I think that's exactly what is missing from that idea that, You know, you major in the liberal arts and sciences, you go to a liberal arts and sciences university, and then you become a barista, right, at Starbucks. And I think that image misses pretty much everything that it means to come from a liberal arts and sciences institution. And, you know, I will agree that research does back the common belief that um, liberal arts graduates learn less than others, but that is only for the first few years after graduation, right? And while it's true that business and engineering graduates earn more right out of college, for example, um, when you compare them to liberal arts peers, that advantage absolutely changes over the course of the career. 
and that we see that students who come from liberal arts and sciences institutions actually perform better in those occupations. Um, research also shows that there's a really high relationship between broad undergraduate education and financial success, which most people absolutely do not believe. If you have people who take more than half their coursework in subjects unrelated to their majors, i.e. have a liberal arts and sciences experience, they're up to 72% more likely than others to be earning more than $100,000 in their careers. Right. They're also more likely to become leaders, altruists, lifelong learners, and feel more personally fulfilled in their lives. And so all the research is enormously clear that if you just focus on earnings right after college, it's true liberal arts and sciences graduates don't do as well. But if you look over the course of the career, they excel financially, personally, and socially. I thought that was a great perspective um, from a college president's chair. The next voice we'll hear from is, is the employer's chair, how the employer thinks about these issues. I'm Laura Evans, and my title is Senior Director of Talent Development for Cerner Corporation. Um, what that means I do is I think about and have responsibility for all of the um, programs and approaches that we use to develop talent before it reaches Cerner's um, doors in terms of interns and apprentices, as well as how we onboard associates um, and give them basic capabilities, foundational capabilities that they need at Cerner. So learning and development is a part of the scope of my responsibilities as well. Should an undergraduate degree prepare students with pretty general skills that they can then adapt to a particular workplace, or should they leave a, you know, a college or university with pretty particular skills that make them ready for the job on day one? What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> um, I think it's a, it's a challenging question, and, and when we have questions like that inside of Cerner, we often call them both and. Right, exactly. Uh, it's a both and problem, um, because I think you really do need both. There is a short term need um, for students and workers to be able to have skills that they can come in and fairly quickly add value in the work setting. Um, and then there is certainly a longer term thought and need for foundational capabilities, deeper thinking, critical thinking, communication, collaboration, problem solving, um, that sort of that foundation that you draw upon again and again mm -hmm. to, to learn the next set of skills as skills change fairly rapidly. And so I think, I think we, that students have to come with both. Mm -hmm. um, I also think we need to think more broadly about how we learn than just learning in the formal education classroom setting. Um, and I think that needs to happen, um, frankly, I think that needs to start happening earlier in the education system um, and continue through post-secondary or higher education um, and, and we really all need to reframe our thinking about learning and recognize that it's a long-term, um, continuous process. I think the days when we could get our learning in a big bundle up front and then rely on that for the next 40 years are probably gone. The pace of change is, is um is too quick for that. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, at the very beginning of this journey, Rob and I had a conversation with just a room full of smart people, and, and they said something that stuck with me throughout this process, and, and that is the idea that, you know, historically a bachelor's degree has been a bank on which people could draw for the rest of their professional careers and wouldn't really need, you know, a, a great deal of additional training after that. Um, and that's no longer the case. As you say, the pace of change has changed so dramatically. Uh, that people are going to have to continue on an annual basis to either, you know, by teaching themselves through online resources or informally le learning from colleagues or formal training programs within their employer, or by going back to school and getting more education formally, that, that just is going to be a need for constant reskilling. Yeah, and, and it's all of the above. Learning, you know, learning definitely comes in different forms, and we see that inside of the workplace as well. We are having to think about how do we help our, our associates access learning content, new knowledge in classroom, outside of classroom, digitally, through peer communities, all kinds of things. One of the many threads in that conversation with Laura Evans from Cerner was about the importance of learning outside of the classroom, and particularly the importance of, of starting early. 
Uh, later in the summer, we had a conversation with John Gall, who heads up the Carpenters Union, um, and he talked a lot about his role in terms of apprenticeships in the trades and workforce development. John and I talked about the average age of the person who's starting an apprenticeship program, and he noted that it's not your traditional college student. These are not 18-year-olds. They tend to be um, older folks, well past adolescents, and early in their adulthood. Hi, yeah, I'm John Gall. I am the uh, Director of Training and Workforce Development for the St. Louis, Kansas City Carpenters Regional Council. Uh, let's see, uh, I began as an apprentice uh, almost 40 years ago, so, so in some way, shape, or form, I've been involved with the apprenticeship system uh, since 79, but I had actually started a year earlier doing some cabinet making and carpentry prize. So actually, this past June was my 40th year in the trade. When it comes to the trades, I can tell you that they've gone through the school of hard knocks. I, we interview all our apprentices and ask them exactly that. Uh, what, where have you been for the last 10, 12, 14 years? And uh, they basically, you know, flat out tell us, you know, that uh, oh, I tried college for a little bit and that wasn't for me. And then I did this job and I tried this. And uh, so they, they really uh, come to a point where, uh, at least from our interviews, uh, what we find out is they're, they're um, now having to look at uh, issues that uh, uh, 10 years prior weren't that important to them. Things such as insurance, uh, pension, uh, you know, things along those lines, their benefits, where, you know, when, when they were 18, that wasn't so important, but when they're 28, and they may now have a house and a car and possibly a spouse and children, um, all those other things that matter, um, they, they finally have to, in a sense, settle down and, and uh, um, come towards a, a, a system that, that has uh, you know, living wages and benefits. John and I talked a little bit about kind of what's the average profile of a person who's entering an, an apprenticeship program. And he said really for most of their programs, it's not a person who's straight out of high school or a college age, quote unquote college age individual. It's somebody who's getting ready to enter their 30s. I think one of the interesting things I learned about apprenticeships in the modern era is that they expand much more broadly rather than just the trades oriented programs that I tend to associate with apprenticeships, but they include a much more diverse array of pathways. We have taken a, a look at apprenticeships in almost any area that uh, there is a, a career pathway. You know, the traditional ones, like you said, are, are carpenters, plumbers, electricians. That's probably the, the hump that we're trying to, you know, get over is the misconceptions out there about apprenticeship. And one is that it's, it's that's for construction trades or the other issue that we often have to get over is that it's it's for union you know affiliated companies only it's that's the furthest thing from the truth um, I, I you know personally um, I'm, I'm very proud of the work that the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education has been doing for the last couple of years with regards to registered apprenticeship and uh, trying to bring that model into the secondary level so traditionally in the United States we're we, you know we, we've been focused on the post-secondary aspect of apprenticeship. But like I said earlier, when you're looking at those gold models, uh, gold standards of the world, like Germany and Switzerland, especially Switzerland, 70% of their high school age students are in some form of apprenticeship. And so when they're in their three or four years of high school, when they graduate, um, they're a journey level something or other, whether it's butcher, baker, or candlestick maker, uh, they're, they're a journey person when they graduate. And so they understand uh, what it takes uh, to, to make a living in the world uh, because they've been living in that world uh, in one way, shape, or form for the last three or four years. And so put things in context, um, I think um, four years ago uh, when, when things really started to catch on fire with this whole notion of, of growing apprenticeship in the United States, um, I mean, let's face the facts. I, I really believe the document that put uh, registered apprenticeship on the map uh, was back in 2011. That was uh, Harvard Graduate School of Education's Pathways to Prosperity. You know, once apprentice, apprenticeship had 
the stamp of approval of a, of a Ivy League institution such as Harvard, I think it changed the game, and other people got interested. And you know, with that being said, it, it, it set, certainly you know set the stage, um, and it, it allowed uh, for uh, different players who needed to be at the table, and I think were afraid to come to the table because of a possible stigma of apprenticeship. You know, prior to 2011, it wasn't unusual for me to hear comments about the three Ds, and that's why uh, high schools across the United States were dumping their industrial technology programs, and, of course, the three Ds are dirty, dark, and dangerous. And then, you know, you started to see uh, a sea change after uh, the Pathways of Prosperity came out. Um, And, you know, again, you know, that was – Soon after the change in 29 CFR 29, and that which allowed and took notice of, of these emerging sectors of the economy, such as healthcare and IT, and uh, kind of broke down some of the rigid barriers that were there before that apprenticeships could only be time based. Uh, now they could be competency based or they could be a hybrid. And so I think that helped out a lot. The final segment in this podcast about rethinking conventional wisdom in terms of post-secondary education and workforce development focuses on the internship experience, and we brought in some experts in this area. Um, One, my colleague Rob Dixon from the Department of Economic Development rejoined me for this piece. We also heard from Ryan Klatt and Nick Rackers, both of whom are instructors in state technical colleges, uh, commercial turf and grounds management program as well as Reese Curlin and Zach Valadeski, both a current and a former state tech student who um, participated in that program and have had really, really interesting internships, one of which um, was with Marion Golf Club in Pennsylvania, which if you don't know much about golf like I don't apparently, it's kind of a big deal, Um, as well as the New York Red Bulls Major League Soccer team and uh, the Boston Red Sox. So it's a really interesting set of experiences, and I, I think you'll like the conversation as much as we did. Ryan and Nick, from your perspective as instructors at State uh, State Tech, how do you ensure that folks from all backgrounds have access to internship programs? And so we also know that you know some internships are paid, some are not. So there's lots of different pressures on students when they're in college, uh, and folks from uh, from different backgrounds in particular might have some financial hardships in particular if they're if they're not a paid internship program. Well, we we don't tell students where they have to go. We want them to tailor their internship to what they want to do with themselves mm-hmm. when they graduate. The question about unpaid internships, that we've in 18 years I've never seen an unpaid internship. A couple reasons for that I think that at Department of Labor there's some pretty strict rules on unpaid internships and in our field I don't know that you can actually do an internship and, and still follow those rules. So that may be part of it, but the other part of it is that the labor pool out there is so poor right now. Is that uh, what we've found is that the employers want interns because they want a student that's educated. They want you know a worker that's educated, somebody that's interested in that field. And over the years, what we've seen is the employers are actually stepping up and paying more and giving more incentives. See, a lot of these guys that travel. Uh, the bigger places will provide housing for them even, that they have incentives to go because there's so many sites that somebody can go and only so many students available. Internships really are different from jobs in some important ways that these students noted. So one, you know, it's about aligning the timing and the curriculum so that students are ready for what they face in their internships. Uh, It's also about networking and making sure there are opportunities to build relationships with industry professionals. The two students we talked with, Reese Curlin and and, uh, Zach Belodesky, had some really interesting observations in this area. Uh, Reese here, yeah, uh, I think State Tech and and Ryan and Nick, you know, did a good job of putting us ahead or competitive with our, our with other students in the industry across the field uh, a couple of key classes um, we have an equipment operations class which you know taught you everything from from how to how to operate typical turf grass equipment to you know how to actually work on the equipment and, and some small engine uh, type type work um, and that that was key going into to my first internship because it was my first time um, uh, working, you know, in the turf grass field. So I 
had I not had that class, I would have had, you know, been going on to, to day one on the job on the golf course, not even knowing, you know, how to operate a, a riding mower. Um, but, but thanks to that class, I, you know, went in with, with a solid grasp. The classes themselves just do a good job of, you know, introducing you to the information, and then the internship itself does a good job of kind of hammering in, you know, the application of that information that you learn. And then just on top of that, just, the, you know, working – in your free time with Nick and Ryan to, you know, work on your materials, work on your cover letters, your resumes, um, and, you know, conversa- just having that conversation on, you know, what where you want to go, where your skills can kind of be utilized, and, and what the next step is was very important. I completely agree with everything else, everything that uh, Reese said, uh, and then all the doors that State Tech opens up with STMA and the Golf Association and the landscape associations and the the job expo that the school puts on, like they're you're pretty much guaranteed you're gonna go somewhere and Brian and Nick are passionate about getting you somewhere and wanting you to learn something. So what does this all mean? I mean, we're, we're calling this episode Rethinking Conventional Wisdom. I think for me, the most important belief that this series of conversations challenged was the possibility that's always concerned me, which is that, you know, deep, rich learning experiences that involve a lot of interaction with faculty or instructors may be the providence of, of um, students like I was, frankly, students who had an opportunity to have a really rich Um, on-campus experience with lots of student leadership activities. The way we've talked today has kind of reminded me that there's a whole other way to think about um, engagement on campus in a way that is particularly well-suited for um, preparing students for the workforce. President Sue Thomas from uh, Truman State University did a really good job of, of bringing this back home and kind of summarizing what I think is a good way to close this conversation. Some research that was done um, almost five years ago now talked about what it takes for students to succeed after they leave college, for them to be engaged in um, their jobs, to have, they call it the Great Jobs, Great Lives Index and Poll. And what they were looking at is what are the experiences in college that helps students become more engaged in their workplace so that they have great jobs and they increase their well-being in a whole bunch of areas so they have great lives. And they came up with six different kinds of um, experiences that they thought made a huge difference for students in these areas. And they were able to show very empirically that they had an impact. And so they looked at whether they had at least one professor who got them excited about learning. Um, Did they have at least one professor who cared about them as a person? Um, Did they have a mentor who encouraged them to pursue their goals and dreams? Um, So that was kind of looking at the mentorship kind of area and the role of faculty. And I think what the faculty do is do these other three things that the poll indicates is enormously important. They work on projects that take a semester or more to complete. Our students learn how to develop a project, stick with it, and figure it out over the long term, no matter what variables change in it. They also have lots of internship opportunities, and it's really important, according to this pool, that students are able to apply what they learn in the classroom. And then the last one is being extremely active in extracurricular activities and organizations. And I tease our students all the time that, you know, there's this book that's called Getting to Yes. I want to encourage our students to learn how to say no sometimes. Our students are really involved in tons of curricular activities on campus and in the community. They very much understand both the private and public benefit of an education. And they give back in lots of important ways. And so our students lead many, many experiences on this campus. And so they get those kinds of real-world experiences while they are here. I'd like to thank those who joined us for this conversation today, uh, starting with Rob Dixon and Representative Travis Fitzwater. Thanks for co-hosting. And then our guest, Dr. Sue Thomas, the president of Truman State University, Laura Evans with Cerner, uh, John Gall, who's the director of training and workforce development at the St. Louis, Kansas City Carpenters Regional Council, uh, Ryan Klatt and Nick Rackers, who are instructors at State Technical College's Commercial Turf and Grounds Management Program, 
and then last but certainly not least, Reese Curlin and Zach Belodesky, who are state tech students. Thanks for listening to the Talent for Tomorrow podcast. If you like our show and want to know more about these economic and workforce development initiatives, read our blog post for highlights from our interviews and more at bestinmidwest.com. Again, that's bestinmidwest.com. You can also subscribe to our podcast and leave a review on iTunes.